There's a mysterious radio burst that the United States and the world has picked up, and it's emanating from outer space. And it's actually not that outer. It's a little bit closer than we like. Too close for comfort, really. And a lot of people are asking questions about this. So we're going to talk about this mysterious radio burst from out there in the stars. But then we're going to talk about something something that's a little bit closer to home. We're talking about the USS Omaha. We've spoken about this ship. Uh, The Navy had some infrared radar that was being beamed out over the ocean, and we saw this little orb that was floating around the water. And then suddenly, the orb just went into the water, and it disappeared. The Navy went over to investigate, couldn't find anything. So how does that work? How do you have a, a physical object that can sort of move in between different medium, from the air to the water, and just be moving like there's no barrier there. It just transmutes between one medium to another, kind of bizarre, strange activity. So we know that that was going on, and now we know that that same ship, we have some radar printouts. We can see that there were 14 other ships flying around, or drones, or UAPs, or UFOs, or whatever you want to call them, hovering around the USS Omaha. What is going on? Then we have another story that the UN is confirming that There were drones that were capable of killing human beings loaded with explosives that were programmed to kill human beings with artificial intelligence, and they just started operating on their own. Okay, this is a real story. We're going to talk about that. Then we're going to talk about the continual evolution of these technologies, about AI, about drones, about computers and about sort of peeking into the future what the next 10 and 25 years looks like i've got a couple clips from a very interesting fellow by the name of charles hoskinson and he is the founder of an organization called cardano and they're working on different computer protocols to solve some of these issues and so he is a very intellectual person somebody who i uh is a little bit out there and so we're going to check in with him as he lays out this roadmap for what the next 10 to 25 years looks like. Bizarre. And he does it in the context of making sure that we stay mindful, that we stay grounded, that we stay in touch with our humanity, and that we don't let these, these technologies, these aliens, these political issues, these you know protests, or whatever is going on in our lives, get the better of us. And so there's a good message, I think, here at the end of all of this. And so I appreciate you joining me in the journey. Let's start with the radio waves, so the mysterious burst from space is unusually close, and it's especially baffling. Now, this is coming from the National Geographic, an organization we don't talk about much here, but we're gonna go through this a little bit quickly. They say that bright, fleeting blasts of radio waves coming from the vicinity of nearby galaxies are deepening one of astronomy's biggest mysteries. The repeating bursts of energy seem to be coming from an ancient group of stars called a globular cluster, which is among the last place astronomers expected to find them. What? Often originating billions of of light years away, the extremely bright, extremely brief bursts of radio waves known as FRBs or or fast radio bursts, they've defied explanation since they were first spotted in 2007. Based on observations to date, scientists thought that the bursts were powered by young, short-lived cosmic objects called magnetars, right? And these, I think this is an image of uh, an artist's conception of one of the galaxies here. So this is M81. The brightest galaxy in the night sky located 11.6 million light years from Earth. And within this galaxy, we've got a lot of stuff going on. We've got Ursa Major, which I which has a magnet. Ursa Major, isn't that the Big Dipper? I think that is the Big Dipper. We, have, uh, we can see a lot of different things in there. It's best observed during April. We've got a lot of hot young stars. Ooh, look at that. Ultraviolet light from hot young stars. Ooh, that sounds good. A number of dust lanes. We've got a black hole with 70 million solar masses. Okay, it's a big galaxy, so we've got all that. Now, within these galaxies, we have these magnetars, which are these super dense, you know, super concentrated uh, balls of, of mass that are spinning really rapidly, and they create this really strong magnetic sphere, or this mag- magnetic field that we can pick up all, all these millions of light years away, or uh, tens of light years, or tens of millions of light years away. Now we're taking a look at this fast radio burst that has been, di- been traced back to the cluster, nearing the, the galaxy that we just looked at, and they're saying that it's among the cluster of aging stars. It's like finding a smartphone embedded in, embedded in Stonehenge. The observation doesn't make sense. Okay, so it's just it's one of these things just doesn't belong here. Why is there a burst of radio waves from an FSR or FSB coming out of this area? Scientists are struggling to explain the cosmic anachronism. They're moving forward to the conclusion that maybe, as with many other celestial phenomena, there are multiple ways to cook up an FRB. 
FRBs might be able to, uh, you know, come from a whole range of sources. We really don't know what they are. They dubbed it uh, this one, 2020-01-20E. They knew of fewer than 30 fast radio bursts in 2017. Like at least two dozen known bursts, this one is a repeater. It's a space engine that produces multiple detectable blasts of radio waves rather than exploding once and vanishing. Right? It's, it's sending a signal. Hello. Hello. We're out here. Hello. Come take a look. It bursts are not as bright as those coming from others that are billions of light years away, but they've allowed scientists to identify the location. From there, the team could identify a source or attempt to identify the source. Now they're saying they're looking through the Milky Way that this is confirming it is 40 times closer than any other known extragalactic FRB. The interpretation of that is where things get very, very interesting. It's very hard to fit it into existing models. It's too close. They're some of the most ancient objects in the observable universe, these globular clusters. They're billions of years old, at least as old as galaxies they orbit, perhaps much older. And still, until now, scientists strongly suspected that FRBs were produced by some of the youngest compact objects yet observed. Magnetars, they're extremely magnetic, flaring stellar corpses produced when young, massive stars explode and die. Once formed, these ultramagnetic corpse lingers for tens of thousands of years before the magnetic field decays, turning it into a neutron star. As far as astronomers know, though, these sparkling, densely packed clusters don't contain these kinds of stars that turn into magnetars. This type of star formation is happening all around the universe. It's like, wow, what is happening here? Says somebody from Northwestern University. We have, this article goes on, you get the gist of it. Here are some plausible explanations. They don't know whether they contain magnetars or other types of stellar corpses. White dwarfs may be the, the cause. They can also, maybe, maybe magnetars cause when two different neutron stars collide. No one, though, has seen a magnetar form in these ways. The Northern University person thinks that maybe there are other ways that we could get these. She says globular clusters are different. Some are denser, some are less dense, whatever. So they're talking about this like it's nature okay we're talking about magnetars and neutron stars and all of that we have a little bit of background here it's aliens we all know that right we've been talking about this for some time here they're here folks over from the daily mail here is their headline holy s they're going fast radar shows the uss omaha being swarmed by 14 ufos in the same incident that the spherical aircraft was filmed disappearing into the pacific ocean Oh my gosh. Holy S is right. Get yourselves ready for this, my friends. This was updated May 28th, which is today. You may recall this incident. This was the 2018 incident. We're going to play this. And this is from the Navy. This is from the USS Omaha. And this is that orb that they're talking about. Now you can hear somebody at one point say something Omaha and this, you're going to watch this thing it's just floating right there above the ocean Frank, Omaha Sydney kid Rafael Peralta the passability to launch Hilo ASAP doesn't look like a bird to me now it's going down towards the water. Watch. Yeah, we have a uh, 31 knots sustained wind, top side, gust of 40. Gone. What was splashed? Splash. Splashed. Mark bearing a range. What the heck was that thing? Well, that was on the same ship that these 14 other objects were flying around. According to the website Mystery Wire, the radar seen in the video clip showed as many as 14 objects as they circled the warship. Sailors aboard uh, the Omaha observed the objects, measured their speed using two different radar systems. Two different radar systems. One of the objects flew as fast as 138 knots, more than 158 miles an hour. I, I guess, uh, is that a bird? A bird, I think, you know, diving down? Can they go that fast? I don't know. Holy S, they're going fast, said one of the sailors, as heard on the video saying. Then adds, oh, it's turning around. Corbell said he obtained the video from anonymous sources. The military does not know where these flying objects came from or disappeared to, according to the Daily Mail. Here is from a mystery wire. They say, this is the post, radar confirms UFO swarms around the ship. Pentagon has reluctantly confirmed. 
Do that one more time. Pentagon has reluctantly confirmed the legitimacy of UFO images captured by Navy ships and air crews, including these photos taken off the coast of Virginia and the better known videos, the so called Tic Tac incident and the gimbal. <laughs> But other than the images themselves, there's been no release of sensor data to buttress these cases. There is now. Well, if you can write a general that long where we're at, and, uh, yes, and then uh, the number of contacts you got, you could force the speed meters off them. Over a period of hours, crew members on the USS Omaha, which is located in the center of this radar screen, monitored the approach of the unknown objects, as many as 14 at one point, all around the ship. Two different radar systems watched the objects and estimated their speed. Track 781 just sped up to 46 knots, 50 knots, closing in. Yeah, that one's pretty much perfectly zero, zero, zero relative, right? Yeah. Corbell obtained the images from sources he declines to identify. The Pentagon's UAP task force considers the Omaha spheres to be true unknowns. The ships that were under observation by the unknowns were unable to track where they came from or where they disappeared to. The Omaha sphere appears to have vanished into the ocean. What was splashed? splashed. At that point, it also vanished from all sensors. In one video snippet, nine of the objects were seen around the Omaha, but two of them dropped off, somehow invisible to two radar systems. And it supports the hypothesis that these are not just a balloon dropping into the water, or it's not um, something that is easily explained. These are true unidentified in mass number, and we'll talk more about that, but that's what we're showing people, where you have radar data that goes with FLIR data what everybody has been belly aching for. So here you go. If these are foreign made high tech drones, how do they fly with no wings, rotors, or detectable exhaust? Do they possess some sort of cloaking ability? The sensor data combined with the video images raises difficult questions. These are on what the heck is going on over here? So that was Jeremy Corbell. He, of course, he's got some sort of sources, or unless he's trolling all of us, he's got all sorts of great sources that are sending this stuff his, his way. He told Mystery Wire that Omaha was one of nine American warships that were warned warmed by UFOs during that same period. He said the video of the radar is corroborative electro-optic data, the likes of which the world had never seen before. He says it shows and supports that there are a multitude of unknowns. Radar footage was, was obtained from an individual who works inside the Combat Information Center. He said it was filmed using a very special visual intelligence cruise that came in, recorded the radar screens. One part one point, the radar showed 14 objects. He said that the release of the radar video was to debunk speculation that the flying saucer was faked or could be explained as a balloon dropping into the water. Right, and, and I've heard also that it was birds. That's why I made the bird comment that, that these are just birds flying around. That, that didn't look like a bird that I had seen before, this floating round bird that has anti-gravity wings or something because that was interesting and it just dropped right into the water. And when you watch these things, you know, you hear, you listen to the people on the other end of the camera and you go, it sounds like a, a, a legitimate emotion, which of course can be faked if it's a fake thing. But, Sounds like the Navy is also confirming this, saying we, yeah, we also we don't know what those were. The video, as we can see here, shows unidentified objects flying into the screen. So we have, you know, the the Omaha is here, and then you know, I'm, I'm not a fighter pilot or somebody who is familiar with radar, but I'm presuming that every one of these is one of these objects flying around. And then we have the vector, the direction that they're going, uh, you know, sort of here, and we can see them all, you know, flying around, all around the ship, and the Navy. It doesn't know or they're not telling us what this is. We have here, this was off the coast of San Diego two years ago. It's been corroborated by military radar, shows a ship being swarmed by the aerial phenomena, some of which are traveling at speeds excess of 160 miles per hour. Several of the UFOs disappeared from radar. At one point, there were as many as 14. So they're just there and then they're gone, which is concerning. The video of the radar corroborates the video that was filmed. So these, you know, these now corroborate the orb video. Here's one more that shows where this was happening. So a map shows the region where fighter jets encountered the UFOs off the coast of Virginia. So we've got, you know, it's happening out of San Diego and now out of the, the East Coast as well. He says these are true unidentified in mass numbers where you have radar data that goes with FLIR, the uh, forward looking infrared data. In the initial video re re released earlier this month, U.S. Navy personnel are seen as having a close encounter 
Two unidentified crew members could be heard exclaiming, wow, it splashed, after the ball made a controlled flight over the ocean, then splashed into the sea. There are true unidentified in mass numbers. When you have radar that goes with that, earlier this month, personnel have been seen having close encounters with UFOs. Two unidentified crew members are heard exclaiming, wow, it splashed. So we got all that. All right, here's a different version of that video. We saw most of this. Took off. Spoken it. Yeah, so we saw that one. Now we're going to look at Navy Graves. So this is a former Navy lieutenant. Okay, he calls these UAPs. He was on with 60 Minutes, and he's calling these a threat to national security. So I think this is an important point, right? We can have kind of jokes about these be being aliens and whether they came from, you know, foreign distant universes is uh, probably unlikely. That being said, it still is a legitimate security concern uh, security concern isn't it if you have these these you know a foreign nation state like china or russia or somebody developing these technologies that are not able to be tracked and we don't know what they are and they have capabilities that we are not anticipating that's slightly concerning for american uh, national safety. He and his colleagues spotted the objects hundreds of times in protected airspace. We're talking about Ryan Graves. From 2015 to 2017, he recorded an encounter off the coast of Jacksonville, Florida. 60 Minutes report came out as the UFO is expected, I'm sorry, as the government is respected to release a report in June on these UFO sightings. Several of these were leaked back to the New York Times in 2017. Marco Rubio, a senator from Florida, called the detailed analysis, called for detailed analysis after he looked at these documents, and he is the head of the Senate Intelligence Committee and asked the Director of National Intelligence for an unclassified report. Right. So these are not, you know, these are not just people on the Internet pontificating about this. These are formal Senate intelligence committees asking for answers. Respected former government officials have conceded that the sightings are credible and that UFO origins remain unknown. John Ratcliffe, who was the DNI, the former director of national intelligence over under the Trump administration, told Fox News that there are not just eyewitness accounts. He says there's videos and there's measurements taken after multiple sensors that are picking up these things. And John Ratcliffe, if you don't recall, right, the office of the Director of National Intelligence is a very important office. And he's the former director of that office. DNI manages all of the communications. It's kind of an interface of all the intelligence agencies in the country. Everything. Army, Navy, the CIA, FBI, all of them. The DNI is sort of the, it's the hub and spoke model. DNI is the hub. We have John Ratcliffe, who's the former director of that, saying, oh, yeah, no, it's not just testimony. It's not just eyewitnesses saying I saw something. There's videos. There's measurements. We have multiple sensors that are picking up these things from multiple different directions. He says, when we talk about sightings, we're talking about objects that have been seen by Navy or Air Force pilots, been picked up by satellite imagery, and frankly, engage in actions that are difficult to explain, movements that are hard to replicate, we don't have the technology for, or traveling at speeds that exceed sound barriers without a sonic boom. Oh, what? All right, here's for me, former Navy Lieutenant Ryan Graves. He says he regularly witnessed UFOs in restricted airspace, calls him a threat to national security. Here he is on C... What is happening? All right. So are these drones, are these some sort of special technology? You know, there's a lot of people talking about drones and a lot of people have talked about drones in a very scary way. And I want to uh, frame this out for you right now. It's not a uh, fun thought, but there are people who are saying, uh, Scott Adams wrote about this in one of his books some time ago. And Balaji Srinivasan is talking about this. And we're sort of seeing this kind of play out right now in the is uh, Israeli Palestinian conflict. It's a lot of, of, uh, technology being thrown at each other, right? It's bombs and uh, non-human re assets, really, that are being shot at both directions. So at some point in the future, or do we do we even use humans anymore? We saw Boston Dynamics with their walking dog. The New York P uh, NYPD tried that. I think they bought a version of that. They put it out in the streets, and people freaked out because they don't want to see these robots wandering around patrolling the streets. So they kind of put the kibosh on that program but the point here is we're, we're talking a lot about technology and rather than using human beings to go and try to kill each other maybe we can just build robots to kill each other uh because that's what human beings do and what if we use drones in that capacity and what if drones now become autonomous and what if they become deadly and what if we can have these little drones that can kind of just come and drop off you know uh, a, a, a bacteria or something that you don't actually need to blow up a building you just come in and drop off a little uh, you know, 
cesium, whatever, you know, radioactive thing that kills you and you, you drop dead. So we, we have this now where we have a lot of people talking about this from a military perspective, flying drones around for war. So here is a story now from the Daily Star talking about killer AI drones. Hmm. Well, it's not from the future. This is like an article that was written today by Michael Moran over at the Daily Star. It says killer AI drones hunted down humans without being told to. Hmm. And <laughs> where did this come from? A UN report. All right. So an autonomous weaponized drone hunted down in quotes a human target last year. It's thought to have attacked them without being specifically ordered to, according to a report prepared for the United Nations. <laughs> Oh, no. The news raises the specter of Terminator Terminator style AI weapons killing on the battlefield without any human control. The drone cargo to quad copper quad copter produced by the Turkish military tech company STM deployed in March 2020 with the Libyan government forces. Carago 2 is fitted with an explosive charge and the drone can be directed at a target in a kamikaze attack detonating on impact. Here's a picture of it. It uses on-board board cameras and artificial intelligence to identify the targets. This looks like a payload here, right? And these things are pretty small, and you just kind of throw them up there, and they just do their thing. The report from the UN Security Council's panel of experts on Libya, published on March 21, was obtained by the New Scientist magazine. In one passage, the report, the report deals details how the Haftars were hunted down as they treated the drones that they were operating in a highly effective autonomous mode. The lethal autonomous weapon systems were programmed to attack targets without requiring data connectivity between the operator and the munition. In effect, a fire, forget, and find capability, says the report. Here's a picture of them. Look at these things. They carry an explosive charge with detonates on impact. So you just launch a bunch of those suckers. You don't even really need missiles. You just fly those up. They just go sit down next to you and blow up. Fire, forget, and find. Right? Just program them. Hey, any, anything in this vicinity that moves, go blow it up. All right. Well, I can do that. Here is another picture of it. Full details of the incident haven't been released. It's unclear if there were any casualties. So I see that just flying around. Suggests that the drones were attacking human beings on their own initiative. So it's already started. Skynet's here. Somebody get Arnold. Oh, no. There is no record of how many casualties, if any, these war machines inflicted. Zach Callerborn of the National Consortium for the Study of Terrorism could be the first time that drones have autonom autonomously attacked humans. He says this development is a cause for concern given that AI systems cannot always interpret visual data correctly. How brittle is an object recognition system? How often does it misidentify targets? Well, going to be a lot of questions about that. It says that this does not show that the autonomous weapons would be impossible to regulate, but it does show that this, the discussion continues to be urgent. All right. So I want to show you this guy. This guy's name is Charles Hoskinson. Very interesting guy. And he is in the crypto space. And I know I've been talking a lot about that, but I'm, I'm studying this right now. And a lot of what interests me about this topic is that it is more than just sort of, you know, moving money around or digital currency around. It's not even it's not even what's interesting about this, really. What's interesting about this is decentralization and about, you know, technology and governance and about how we use technology to govern ourselves. Okay? And I mean that in terms of governance. And, you know, we, we, right now we're governed by the nation state of the United States. We have a legislative branch, an executive branch, a judicial branch. And they're pretty bad at most things that they do, right? And they, they sort of waste a lot of time. A lot of, a lot of efficiency is just gone because we're dealing with humans. We're dealing with politicians. We're dealing with emotions and a bunch of bureaucracy that really doesn't do anything. I mean, it, it really is pretty ineffective when you think about it. And that is largely by design. And we've sort of created our country to be that. We don't want to give them a bunch of power. We want to decentralize the power between these three co-equal branches. We give everybody term limits. We make sure that no single person or no single entity can seize too much power. You got to get out of there every four years and we have voting and systems and a constitution because we know that the country is going to tend towards totalitarianism. Our founders knew that, that because we're human beings, we just like to consolidate power. We want more of it. And people want more money and more power and more things. And we sort of will structure our society. Many people will give up their freedoms and liberties in order to secure a little bit of security. And so the person who grants them that, they'll get more power in exchange for, for providing that security. And human beings are very complicated. Some people are smarter than others. Some people are born with, with different resources. There's a lot going on here. And so we've got these systems now that 
we are living under, living in like the United States and we've got all these different, you know, social clubs and we've got educational systems and we've got judicial systems and we've got uh, political systems and governance systems and we've got all these different things that we do engage in on a daily basis. But remember, most of these things were built generations ago and they're really optimized for the technology of those times. I mean, even think about this on a daily basis. How many times do you sit at a red light and nobody's driving around anywhere? right? That worked 50 years ago. Does that make sense right now? I mean, can't they turn the, can't they tell that there's nobody coming and change the light so you can just drive through it? What's so complicated about this? But the, the intersection was built for people with 20 years ago technology, right? It's old stuff. And so if we're going to be asking ourselves now that we've got a lot of technology and we've got a lot of power that we've got a lot of smart people thinking about different governance systems, and we're talking about decentralization, the same principles and the same concepts that made America great, this balance of power, this separation between the branches, these protections against the consolidation of control. Those are all great things. It's what made America so damn good is because we don't have a lot of the uh, the, the predispositions to towards authoritarianism that a lot of other systems have. It's a beautiful thing. So what if we can use technology now to you know, not, not necessarily create killer drones or do anything that is dystopian, but to enhance those systems, to go from this nation state that we have to have 435, you know, knuckleheads banging their heads together in Congress. Maybe there's better ways to do things. Maybe we can re-envision our voting system or ensure that our freedom of speech and our freedom of association and freedom of religion are sort of hard coded into our systems of government so that the, the, the actual government can't come down and encroach upon those things. And if we are necessarily just as a consequence of technology, moving towards more virtual realities and more digital currencies and more engagement with AI systems, many of us are spending most of our days on the internet now. For a long time last year, many people didn't even leave their houses. Okay, Everything was on the internet. And so technology is steadily moving that direction. And so with that progression comes some scary ideas, comes some scary thoughts. And I want to play you this clip from this guy. His name is Charles Hoskin, Hoskinson, and he is the creator of two different protocols. One is he's a co-founder of Ethereum. He doesn't like to be introduced that way because he sort of left that project. And now he is creating and working on this new project called Cardano. I'm doing a very deep dive on this project because it is sort of a a third level blockchain. Bitcoin was all about transferring currency. Then Ethereum was really about smart contracts. Now we're talking about smart contracts and governance and all sorts of long sustainable systems that can maybe create some very interesting economies and, and societies really around the world. Very, very fascinating stuff. And he's, I, I think, honestly, peeking into the future. I think that there is going to be an internet of these blockchains. Like every single one of these blockchains is sort of like, Think of it like a thread in a, a tapestry in this really intricate rug, rug that's being you know woven together. And we're going to have this internet of blockchains that are all communicating with one another. So what we are, we're going to hear from him is a, a clip from this video. It's about a 30 minute video and it's all about mindfulness. And you're thinking, well, this guy's a crypto guy. We're talking about AI and the future and space aliens and all this stuff. What are we talking about mindfulness for? And it's because he's really a, kind of a philosopher to some degree, and he's somebody who's thinking a lot about these issues, about governance and about what future technology looks like and about building the world for that future, not current, like, you know, not, not building technology to meet 2021 needs, but 2050 needs. And so it's very forward thinking. In this video, he is responding to sort of a market crash, okay? There are ups and downs in the cryptocurrency markets. There was a big crash that came down and uh, people are devastated when that happens. They lose a lot of money and they think that they're never gonna get it back and, and people invest for different reasons and they get hurt. So he makes this video and he talks about mindfulness. He talks about this mindfulness solution and he walks through all of, you see all these tabs up here. He walks through all of these different things that he does to meditate and focus on, you know, thinking and about how we can stay connected with our humanity in the face of all of these things happening, right? He's a big public figure. He's got a lot of criticisms. People hate, you know, the cryptocurrency space is very vitriolic and he is telling us about, you know, how to sort of brace yourselves when the market dips, when you get criticized, when the world is coming after you and how to stay steady. And at, 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 it's about 20 minutes of that. Then we get into this one clip. And so I just want to put context on this. I'm, I'm going to show you a clip 
that this guy you're probably going to listen to and you're, you're going to think this guy is out there, man. This guy is weird as can be. That's because I'm pulling this out of context. Okay. It's a 30 minute video. Go watch the rest of the video. I'd really encourage you to do that because he's, he's absolutely brilliant. A little weird, but he's very, very brilliant. And I want to show you this clip. So let me frame this clip out. He is now detailing sort of what the future looks like if we peek ahead and he's going to be talking about AI and these relationships and about uh, having relationships with computers and about being able to control your genome and about manipulating your mental state using technology. And he's showing us examples up until this point. He's giving us examples of this technology that's being built right now. There's a, a company that they have this technology that costs like a hundred thousand dollars, but it's a helmet. And it looks like, you know, in five, 10 years that this will be a consumable thing, a, a consumer based product. It's a hundred thousand now, but if you reduce it by a factor of 10, right. Or a hundred other people can buy that and it can measure your brain waves and, you know, do all sorts of crazy stuff. And so we're knocking on the door of this. We've got the U S Navy. We've got technology. We don't know what the heck it is. We've got AI systems and drones that are already being released and flying around the world and theoretically killing people or attempting to. And so this stuff is coming. And I just want to make sure that we're all staying mindful in the middle of all of this, in the middle of a rapidly changing world, up and down with our economies, up and down with all of this stuff. We got to stay connected to mindfulness. So I'm going to play two clips from Mr. Hoskinson. First, detailing this, this, this future that feels weird. But when you think about it, we're kind of already starting this direction. Here he is on clip one. We are going to live in 25 to 30 years in a world that is not recognizable to those who live 10 years, 15 years before us. We're going to live in a world where AI is the dominant intelligence. Every surface is a computer. We're going to live in a world where everything is programmable, including your genetics, where virtual reality is indistinguishable from reality, and people will have relationships with virtual avatars which are indistinguishable from relationships with real people. We're going to live in a world where medicine has evolved to a point uh, where neurobiology can be hacked, neural trans can be hacked, where you can have any mind state that you want, from bliss to hate to whatever it might be. And we're going to live in a world where big data and pervasive computing has robbed us of our privacy, except for what we can claw out from immutable concepts like constitutions and blockchains and these types of things. We're going to live in a world where globalism is the standard. The problems that occur in Zimbabwe or Rwanda will no longer be in a newspaper. They're going to be your problems. And we learned that from COVID, something that happened in Wuhan has impacted the entire world. And that's now the standard, not the exception to the rule. So you need new systems for this. You need new democracy for this, new way to vote, new way to think, new incentive schemes, new way to talk to people and communicate with people, to live with people and forgive people. If you can't do that, well, then what's going to happen is we'll descend into a world conflict. And the winners of that conflict will just install a new system or regress us back to before uh, we got all this technology. So I, I think he's onto something here, right? He talks about these, these new ways of doing, doing business. We're seeing that our current system is largely ineffective and the project that he's working on is helping to lay the framework for this. And he's not the only person doing this. This is really what the crypto space, in my opinion, a lot of it is, is not productive. There's a lot of, you know, kind of goofy projects going on. But what leads me interested, makes me most interested is guys like this, guys who are saying, you know, our current system, our current government, our current structure, the way that we're doing things is so broken that we're just going to hard code it into the algorithm. And we're going to build our own system on the back of that. Very, very interesting stuff. Here's one more clip from him where he's giving us a little bit more hope. All you really can do is work on yourself and be a good person and try to evangelize concepts that you feel are important in this new order. For me, it's about systems and it's about giving people control and power over their lives. I don't believe for a moment that people are stupid. I don't believe for a moment that people are intrinsically evil and bad. And if you give people the ability to control their own lives, that everything will come collapsing down. 
right? I, I agree with the guy. I think there's some good stuff here. Just wanted to share that with you. I know it's a little bit weird. I know it's a little bit out of the ordinary, but uh, let's take some questions over from watching the watchers.locals.com. Sharon says the radio bursts are a normal phenomenon of pulsars on the Omaha. Were they in the Bermuda Triangle by chance? I think they were in the uh, in the Pacific over by San Diego. So I don't think that they were anywhere near it. Actually, we have Sharon says on the AI, all this is transhumanism crap. <laughs> They're trying to turn us into the Borg. It started already with mind control. You know, I, I think that you're onto something here, right? They, when they talk about sort of communicating with AI and stuff, we kind of do that already. I was thinking about this. I was thinking that's bizarre. I'm never going to talk to a machine like that. I'll never have a relationship with uh, a machine. I go, well, I I already talk to them all the time. They're they're on my phone. They're on my little you know pucks that are around the place. I won't say their names, but you get it, right? We're all sort of already kind of connecting with that to some degree, and now we're talking about taking it a step further. It's a wild stuff. We have Jeremy says, I believe the UFO seen lately have been black ops top secret testing that is done by an organization that are sanctioned by our government. They can't be on any books, and no one can talk about it because they either don't have clearance to know about it, or would never acknowledge it if they did know. Yeah, and so. You know, I, I, I was thinking about that, Jeremy. What if it is our own government? And they're, these are just essentially war games, right? They're going to fly them over our own ships so that we can measure our response to these. Uh, or it could be another country who is poking us, right? And would the U.S. do that? Would the U.S. poke other countries? Like, would we fly these around other nations? Probably not, right? Because if they found out about it and they knew that it was the U.S., now you could provoke an international incident. So maybe you just test your own technology on your own crews so that if something were to happen, there's no blowback. We have Hack Consulting says, globular clusters are thought to be the last place to find them due to the lack of neutron stars. Then again, who knows? White dwarfs of old stars could be there. Neutron stars could still be there if they are white dwarfs. I think the journalist just wanted to write something and made nonsense. I don't know. It's just trying to get onto the hype train of aliens and the UFOs shown do not provide evidence of advanced technology, just tricking the camera and data. It's bullshit. <laughs> All right. There you go. You've got the conclusion there from hack. Thank you. Hack. We have Nadarb says, if you have a second before you wrap up today, have you been following the Alan Dershowitz versus CNN case? And if so, wondering what you thought he just got discovery and I haven't heard very many people talking about it. So uh, I have not heard about it in the Darb. I actually have not seen it. Uh, I subscribe to Alan Dershowitz, but I don't watch him often. Not sure if he's been talking about it. But yeah, I'm happy to pull that case. I love talking about that. And if he's taken it to CNN, we'll support him on that. We got Sharon says, there's a lot of really exotic stuff out there in the universe. Astronomers are always discovering new stuff. The FRBs probably have a natural explanation other than aliens. Probably, Sharon, I know. I just kind of joke about the alien stuff. I hope they're there. I want to see them. I want to meet these fellows. It, now, have they traveled, you know, a billion miles to get here and landed? Uh, I have a hard time believing that, but would be kind of fun. Jeremy says, UFO literally means unidentified flying object, which is by definition unidentified, not alien. If the object is not known, then why would people's first guess be aliens? Jeremy, because we want to see some stuff go down, brother. That's why. We want to see Will Smith and Jeff Goldblum kick some A, brother. We want to see it go down. Let's get the aliens in here. You know, liven things up a little bit. <laughs> All right, we got Sumper Sun says, what a crazy time when I'm more outraged by BLM than UFOs. <laughs> I love that. I love that, Sumper Sun. Yeah, UFO. look, the UFOs haven't done anything to anybody. I'll tell you this much. The UFOs haven't called me a racist, patriarchal white male. I don't have any problems with them. Uh, Patrice Colors, though, she's got a, a different perspective on all of that. Oh, that's great. LT13 says, I live right here by that base in VA, and I've never seen a Tic Tac. Just saying. Well, there you go. No sightings from LT13 near Virginia. We got Sharon Quinney in the house. Says, As long as folks are worried about space aliens, they won't be concerned about having more of our civil liberties taken away it is weird you know it is weird that we're starting to see more of the government officials just kind of like talk about it just kind of haphazardly like oh nonchalantly right uh, we, we covered that clip here of even obama getting in on the game and now that now that some of the more mainstream politicians are coming out now you start to say all right now it's officially the u.s government because they're if they're going to be you know kind of touching it a little bit maybe there's a softening that they are preparing us for we have underscore shades says the government has to release the deep info soon. Yeah, it's coming out in June, apparently, which is next month. That's like right around the corner. So they are trying to get control of all of this. 
Both there are aliens and our very own UFOs. Yes, we've had the anti-gravity tech since World War II. And now's the Fourth Reich. Plenty of on all this. If people want to research highly credible too, they don't want us to know that we've had them. I love that stuff. Underscore shades. I love it. I love the the um, the shows where it's the secret Nazis who create the ultimate dimension and they send back, you know, some Nazi and then the good guys, the allies send back some, you know, FDR or, or you know, Einstein travels back and there's this time shift and all of that stuff. Love it. It's a lot of fun. Ridiculous, but it's a lot of fun. LT13 says, so they only go around military equipment. There are fishermen and everybody else in that water and no one has reported anything like that. Yeah, I'd be curious. I'd be curious if anybody would believe them. You know, if they were fishing out there catching tuna and they see that and they call the military, the military goes, oh, great. Yeah, you saw an airplane. Yeah, that. Thanks. Thanks for that. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe they have. Hey, maybe all these people who are sort of, you know, wandering around the backwoods and they come back with uh, like their shirt off and their hair all frazzled and they say, I was abducted by aliens. Maybe they're all true. All of them. Hack Consulting says, maybe you got burned out on Clubhouse because you were doing it every day. Maybe once a month or a thing or two or twice a week. That way we could have a solid a period to talk off the record about aliens briefly and solidify what is bullshit in the media. Uh, I'm down. I'm down. We can do, we can do more clubhouses. I'm okay with that. We, we had the, um, I guess we could always queue that up for our monthly meetup aliens. I love aliens. Can we make this an alien channel? Should we just make this an alien channel now? Don't leave. Don't unsubscribe. We're not going to do that. I promise. Sharon Quinney says, speaking of technology, when are you going to give a seminar on cryptocurrency and starting our own country? Well, so I, I'm, I'm talking a lot about cryptocurrency on the channel number two. And it's again, it's not because like I'm pushing Dogecoin, like go buy these meme coins. I really think that these are fun. Like this is a, a way to structure governance into the foreseeable future. And I talk about, I mean, I mean this in terms of actual governance. A lot of people say it's just Bitcoin. It's just, you know, it's digital gold. It doesn't mean anything. That was that was accurate in 2010. OK, not anymore. This is a whole new way of organizing society. And there are a lot of smart people who are working on it. And I think it's actually going to mean something because the other the other systems are failing around the world. Biden's going to print six trillion dollars. So people say, hey, you know, cryptocurrencies, they're, they're sort of like they don't really mean anything. They're just kind of it's kind of money out there in thin air. Where do you think that six trillion dollars is coming from? Nowhere. When am I going to give a seminar on it? I don't know. You know, I think I might, I might put together a um, sort of like an intro to Bitcoin, uh, not because other people haven't already done that. A lot of people have already done that. There's so much content out there about getting into this space, but I want to encourage some people in my life to do it. So I may, you know, just like I did with the existence systems, people in my life said, Hey man, how do you stay organized and how do you stay on top of stuff? And so I made the existence systems to help kind of just give that to people and say, here, this is how I do it. Uh, I might do the same thing with cryptocurrencies because I'm having people now ask me, hey, uh, what are you doing over there with that stuff? So I may just put something together, just a quick intro, just so I can say, hey, follow this list of instructions. Because I, I do want to see people, you know, if, if, they're, if they want to play around in this space and they believe in it, I want to help them get started. Uh, starting our own country, well, that's that's Balaji Srinivasan. We got to talk to him about that because he is the godfather of the new country. Rob says these guys tried this once around 1776, worked out till the computers took over the election, and now you want to give all this to AI. Well, here's the the very interesting thing about blockchain. It's super cool. Let's see if I can. Well, I'm not going to pull it up right now, but you can actually. What's so cool about the blockchain? It's all transparent. You can go you can go look at it. I mean, you can actually go on to uh, Cardano and look up the chain and you can see what's happening there. So you can see everything. It's all decentralized and it's all public and open source. It's not like Dominion, right? Dominion and the, these other companies, everything's closed source. Everything's kept under lock and key. We can't see anything that they're doing. And all of these meetings happen behind closed doors and all these politicians will tell you one thing and go do another. Do we need them anymore? Or can we maybe as, as free thinkers operate on a consensus basis in a way that that, that doesn't require anything from you, right? The, the, the current reason right now that we have a representative democracy really is because it, it, it's too much work for all of us to be as informed on a system of governance, okay? We all can't be up to speed on all of the issues all the time. We can't sit there and study the bills and read all the, these new you know, legislative proposals and hash out all the minutia. 
So we delegate that to our representatives and they go do the voting for us. Well, there are different ways that you can do things with technology where you can sort of create a system of governance that runs itself and you can create different economies that power that system of governance. And then you can have the people who wanna participate in the democratic process who are voting with their tokens, their coins and their wallets, and they get stake in the system and then they go and then they can participate in it in a democratic fashion. It's a different model. And if you don't like that system, guess what? Pick up and go to the next one. You don't have to use Cardano. You can go over to ICP. You can go over to Ethereum. Pick a different system that you want to go be a part of if you don't like your current one. And then we can hard code in governance. All right. Last one here is from Jeremy Matrita says, I believe there are many useful applications of AI, aka machine learning. One downside to using an AI to design an efficient vehicle for you is you need to be prepared to get ejected from your vehicle as, as it is optimizing for efficiency. I see what you did there, Jeremy. So if we sort of give the AI uh, the ability to get rid of the superfluous waste of space, the first thing they're going to do, eject the human being out of there. Get out of here. You're a terrible driver. You're going to ruin the system. You're going to tell me to you know, break here, go too fast. You're useless. Get out. I'm going to drive myself. It's an interesting world, folks. We've got a lot of cool things coming up, a lot of scary things coming up, but at least we're going to be able to go through it together and uh, want to welcome some new people to our community as they join us along the ride. We have, come on, man, who joined up over at Locals. Come on, man. Come on, you Dog, what do you, uh, pony soldier, true to not limit the pressure. All right, we got Joe Biden's in the house. Come on, man. We got Benevolent One also joined up. They are now a part of the Locals community. Watching the watchers.locals.com is the address if you want to go check it out. All these great people here asked some tremendous questions today. Thank you for keeping the show on pace, up to speed, and lively. We have some great things you can download if you go over to watching the watchers.locals.com. Things like my book, it's called Beginning to Winning. You can download a copy of the slides that we went through today. Download a copy of my impeachment party documents or the existence systems, which is a personal productivity tool available for free at locals. Links are shared throughout the day and there are a lot of great people over there. I mentioned that we have our monthly meetup coming up on Saturday, June 26. So you can head on over to watching the watchers.locals.com. The link is not up yet, but I will post it at some point in the near future. We also have our law enforcement interaction training, which is gonna be Saturday, June 12th. It's gonna be 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time. It's gonna be about an hour and a half. And then we'll spend another 30 minutes or so just chit-chatting. And uh, that's it, my friends. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. Want you to be a part of the group and the community at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And my friends, before we get out of here, one final reminder that I am a criminal defense attorney here in Scottsdale, Arizona, and we love helping good people facing criminal charges to find safety, clarity, and hope in their cases and in their lives. And so if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona who needs help with a criminal case, we would be honored and humbled if you sent them our direction so that we had the opportunity to help. We can help with anything. Things like DUIs, drug offenses, misdemeanors, felonies, clearing up old records, helping people restore their right to vote, or the ability to possess a firearm again. There's a lot that we can do. We can clear up old mug shots and really help people kind of get things back, whoa, back on track a little bit. We're very passionate about what we do. So if you happen to know anybody in the state of Arizona that needs some help, we offer free case evaluations. We would love your referral. Before we head out of here, a couple reminders that I have a couple other channels that are down below in the description. So if you're interested in crypto, there's a crypto channel. If you're interested in law, like the, the nuts and bolts law, that's at our r, &R Law Group channel. And if you're interested in some of the non-live content that we're gonna be posting, that I'm gonna be posting, that's at my other channel, Robert Gruler ESQ. So go check that out. The reason for that is YouTube doesn't really like us on this channel and uh, we're gonna diversify a little bit. So we're not gonna be back here on Monday. There's not gonna be a live stream show on this channel on Monday, but I am very likely going to be posting a bunch of other stuff on the other non-live channels. So go check that out. If you want to uh, stay connected that way, I'd really appreciate it. Otherwise, my friends, we are done here for the day. We're going to be back here on Tuesday. We've got a very long weekend and I'm very hopeful that everybody enjoys themselves, has a nice long weekend. Remember why we are taking the time off and uh, you know, spend time being reflective and with with the ones you love and the people who are most important most importantly we unplug from politics from just for just a little couple days because we're going to be back into it hard on monday you better believe that so i want you to make i want to make sure that you are here you are subscribed you're joining us for the show it's going to be tuesday 4 p.m arizona time 5 p.m mountain time 6 p.m central time 7 p.m on the east coast for that one florida man everybody Thank you so much for joining me today on the show. Have a tremendous long weekend. Sleep very well tonight, and I will see you right back here on Tuesday. Bye-bye.